Welcome to Dr. Dayo Durban Online. We're a church family on mission to see Durban change into a place where Jesus reigns. Here's this week's message. It's so great spending some time here with you guys. I remember the first time when we moved down to Durban many years ago. Thank you. Um, many years ago, one of the biggest challenges for us were the humidity. I don't know if you have moved down here, especially over January and February, there's a humidity that uh, can't be handled by any person here in Durban. So, um, yeah, to get used to that is quite an incredible story. We had to drove from our house to the pavilion. We were staying in New Germany to the pavilion just to get some air conditioning. I don't know what you guys are doing while there's load shedding and in, you can just experience the humidity. So I'm just praying that everybody here has a solar panel up on the roof just to assist in all the challenges. Thank you very much. It's so great spending some time with you guys this morning. And um, just to give you some insight, is we will be part of the Doxadio family next year. It will be 25 years full-time. Um, can, can you imagine that? So 25 years in the Doxadio family and dream. And I always tell the story where I tell people, if you don't know us yet, um, we have been in Doxadio since the beginning. So I started as a youngster in the Doxadio family in 1992, we moved down, well, I moved down from Polokwane to uh, Pretoria, and a friend invited me at that stage to the Doxa Dayo, or it was not even Doxa Dayo, um, to the Corpus Christi environment. And uh, what happened is, it's quite incredible. We were sitting, uh, if you haven't been in Pretoria yet, but if you're going down there and you're going to visit the site there, please come and visit us at, at Doxadale Brooklyn campus. And I remember I was sitting there and I was driving, you know, you get one of those cars, they call it a Master 3 to 3. You only drive from 3 to 3, then it breaks down and then you need to fix it. And then, so I drove one of those cars many years ago and um, I was praying as a youngster, I said, Lord, I need to be in an environment where the church know where they are going, knows where they are going to and the things that's happening there. And I remember sitting in the auditorium for the first time and hearing Adam Platt speak for the very first time about the vision and the dream of Doxadale. And I realized I need to be part of this. And over the next seven years, I served within the environment, felt the call of God on our lives. And in 2000, uh, I became part of the Doxadeo family. I was number 18 on the list. John is always telling he's number 11 on the list. I'm number 18 on the list of the leadership of Doxadeo. So just remind him when you see him again, number 18 on the list. So um, I remember when John still started the Camel Drift Doxadeo in a small setting like this. So I'm just reminded of the uh, leaps and bounds that we have grown in, and I'm so proud of what's happening here. But one of the stories that I must tell you about, Lorraine, we were at one of the functions there. Before he met his lovely wife, Gerda, he was still a young man, figuring out what to do with his life. And he was walking up to me and he says, Martinez, I just want to tell you, and I just want to say thank you to you we started a process called Gifts in Action about the Holy Spirit. And we had some CDs. Who has, still has some CDs? I don't know if there's still people with some CDs. Leon Potgitter, you are very... Uh, yeah, let me just don't say anything there yet. But we made a CD called um, The Voice of God. And he was listening to that. And he walked up to me and he says, I have never heard something like this in my life. It changed and revolutionized my life. And I remember in the next two years, we were visiting Bloemfontein and um, spending some time there. And just to see how they have grown and 
We are so proud of them and such a privilege to spend some time here today with them as well. So like I said, we are now leading the Speed Changes Institute. Um, just giving you some insight on that. Um, on the picture, if you can go to the next slide, that will be great. Just to give you some uh, insight regarding that. So what we are doing right now is uh, in 2017, uh, John Simons asked us to take up leadership of the City Changes Institute. And we had to re regenerate, rejuvenize, change the whole picture regarding that. And when you are going onto the site, that um, QR code will take you to the City Changes Institute site. Um, if you can't find it on the Dr. Dale website, you scroll down to the City Changes Institute. But what we are doing is we're empowering leaders to raise city changers. What do we mean by that? We say we are actually taking people and say, listen, God has called you for much more than this. He has called you to transform your city. So you're not just going to have a vertical relationship with God. You're actually going to influence your environment. So from that premises, two things that I want to show you that we are responsible for so that you can have an idea on what we are doing is the first one is the second picture uh, that I'm going to show you uh, for our theological students. So in Doxadale, we have a partnership called the South African Theological Seminary. So you can study through us. There's about uh, almost 150 students studying through the City Changes Institute all over the world. And part of that process is we have a five-fold approach to empower people. We have about 22 uh, full-time City Changes Institute students uh, online and also on our premises that say, I want to take up leadership uh, in that specific environment. And I don't want to give more detail. You can find that on the website. And then the other thing that we are doing is uh, the story of a city changer. So you will see there's a picture. The next one there is a picture of the journey of a city changer. So what we believe is that every person that becomes part of the Doxadale environment, you have the capacity to transform your environment. And we want to take you through a process called knowing God, loving people, and impacting your world. And this is what we call the City Changes Institute Diet. So we have a whole ecosystem to empower, transform you. So some of the guys here are doing, Pierre and his wife is doing um, um, CCP online. So as part of the leadership, we say this is so important to become part of that, we have an online learning center. And then you can see on the next picture, we have 22 other learning centers all over the world. And we are actually here in Durban and uh, partnering one of our kingdom partners is Vines Church. And they have three sites. And tonight I'm going to visit them. And Monday night I will be spending time with the leadership to make sure that we partner together in the Durban environment with this. And there's more than, we just breached this week the 700 mark of students involved in this process all over the world. So just to give you an idea <laughs> what's happening. When we started off in 2017 redefining it, there were about six, 60 students in three different year groups. And we only had one learning center Today, there's more than 700 people involved. So that's incredible just to see that. So people taking up responsibility. So that's just to give you an idea of who I am. And um, it's so great to spend some time here with you guys in one service because apparently I have until this evening to influence and impact your life. So Rian is very excited about that, to preach the next three hours and then we will have some lunch and then we will come back and, no, just joking, okay? Just joking. Okay, so we are busy in a series called Hope. When you're thinking about hope, what is your thoughts? I don't know about you, but I was just reminded in this series when we are talking about hope is to create hope in your environment. And the first week we talked about, um, about what is hope. Hope is not something, hope is someone. 
So that's very important when we are talking about that to understand our def definition lies within Christ. So if you are making notes, I'm going to use a lot of scripture. So please make sure that you are dotting this down so that you can make this part of your discussion. The second bit, we talk about the word, how do we behold? We first need to understand who we are. Now, Adam Platt, last year, he spoke to us um, in one of our CCP sessions, and I love his session on that. He says, firstly, people need to understand that Christ needs to become your Lord. So he's always using this statement. He says, if Christ is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Okay, so maybe I must just repeat that. My Afrikaans um, background is just hindering me sometimes so that people can hear me clearly. So if Christ is not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Meaning he must be your personal Lord and Savior. And we are good at that to bring people to Christ, to speak to the lostness in our environment. But then we need to discover and we need to understand that this is just introduction to what I'm going to say today. Then we need to understand our right standing in Christ, our identity. So we first need to go to right standing, but sometimes and often we battle because as Christians, we always ask this question, how do I live? So instead of going to right standing, we skip right standing immediately going to right living. Okay? I don't know if this is the same in your environment, but in our environment, people are often asking me, Martinez, what do I need to do? How can I live right for God? And then from right living, we go to public lordship. But sometimes we skip right standing and right living and we have a celebrity that's in our space. Oh, at least he's a Christian. At least he's somebody that knows God. But the process to grow in that is to make sure that if Christ is your personal lordship and he's becoming your hope, then you need to identify yourself with hope. That's the second week. So you need to identify yourself with Christ so that you can be whole. The vocabulary of the New Testament is to see. The vocabulary of the Old Covenant, Moses' covenant, is to hear. So what do you see? That's very important. So sometimes, some of us grew up, I grew up in a very Dutch Reformed environment. So when we are talking about God, God is in the heaven Christ is living in my heart and the Holy Spirit is here somewhere. <laughs> Hello? But to understand the New Testament vocabulary, John 14 to 16, he's making the following statement. He says, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit will come and tabernacle, will come and make his home inside of you. He will move in. He's not moving out. So that's very important in our understanding of this. So the second week we talked about to behold. We first need to stand from a place of rest. See what he is seeing so that we can do what he is doing. Not the other way around. Then I will create a guilt cycle in my life. So last week Lorraine talked to us about the whole aspect of becoming a hope carrier. And the key of becoming a hope carrier is to understand the resurrected life. So my theme for today is to understand this and um, if we can just move to the next resurrection, is it on there? Romans 14, let's go there. So when we are talking about the kingdom of God and especially hope, it is connected to the working of the Holy Spirit in my life and I'm going to take some time to unpack this. So some of this you will know. Some of this will give you some new insight. But in Romans 14 verse 17, he's making the following statement. He says, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, 
and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Christ in this way is acceptable to God and receives human approval. Who have ever seeked human approval? Hello? Come, be honest. You don't know me, so just be honest. Okay? It's interesting when he talks about this, he says, you need to understand who you are in the Holy Spirit, and you need to serve Christ according to that, and he will give you favor. So if one of the components in Romans 14 verse 17 is not in place, I will seek approval from the outside in, not from the inside out. So just listen to this while we're unpacking this for a moment. I've given you a framework. I love frameworks because that helps me a lot. So when we are talking about righteousness, for the kingdom of God is righteousness. What is righteousness? Just unpacking this for a moment. Um, it's saying the following. It says righteousness, he says, to live according to his image. When you're going to the original text, he says, um, in Genesis 1 verse 26 to 28, he's making the following statement and he says, you are made according to his image. We are of the same essence. We are of the same likeness. So when we are talking about this, when we are talking about righteousness, it's giving us this explanation. There's no distance between me and God. Righteousness, we are the gift of righteousness. You don't become righteousness, but you are actually somebody that living according to his design. Now, Miles Monroe always made this statement. He says, if you are confused, you never ask the creation because they are just as confused as you are. You always ask your creator. So when you have challenges in your life, how many times do you go back to ask your best friend instead of God? <laughs> I know there's no challenges here like that. No relationship issues. We are all holy today. No problems with that. No. So when we are talking about this, he says it's so important to understand righteousness means to live according to your design. Meaning you understand that you have a creator. He's the reality in your life. And you start there. That's righteousness. Then he goes on, then he says peace. Now when he's explaining this in the original text, we always see peace as Oh, I just want to rest. Oh, I just want to make sure everything is fine like this. When he talks about peace, he's talking about somebody that's in right relationship with their God, in right relationship with their peer group and relationship on this earth, and in right relationship with your stuff. Listen to this. This is so important. So when you are looking at your life, he defines peace as not, oh, everything is peaceful. It's lovely today. We are going to swim in the sea and what have you. No, no, no. He's explaining that you find yourself in the center of your relationship with God, other people and your stuff. That's the moment of peace. Colossians 3 is explaining this. He says, whenever you might need to make a decision, do you have the peace of the Holy Spirit? He's actually asking, are you in right relationship with your God? Are you in right relationship with the other relationships around you? And are you in right relationship with your stuff? Oh, I love the word, man. So he says it's actually to live in wholeness. The word being used in the original text is the word sozo. To be whole, to be complete, meaning standing in the right relationship. Everything 
is living from the inside out. So, just going back to the image and the design in Romans 1, uh, Romans is giving us that definition. So when he talks about uh, righteousness, he says in Romans 1 verse 16 to 17, he says from faith to faith. The righteous shall live by faith. The first word of faith there is the word to discover Jesus Christ. The second word of faith there is to grow up in the maturity of Christ. And then he says, now that you understand your faith, have discovered, have beholding Christ. Now you are living according to that. And that's the definition of faith. Romans 1, 16 to 17. So when he moves on from here and he says, you first need to discover your right standing in Christ. And then you can move on to this place of understanding your peace, your wholeness. Ephesians 5, 15, I love that scripture, especially in the Amplified Bible. He says, then look carefully how you walk, not like unwise men, but like intelligent people, understanding the will of God. Meaning it's somebody that's living in their right standing with God and giving them insight regarding that. And then he comes to this piece, and I love this. He says, joy. Now, I don't know if the Durbanites are joyful people. Are you joyful people? Yeah. Are you laughing a lot? Especially when you, uh, I remember when we were in Pine Town many years ago, leading the campus, like Lorraine said, then um, over December, especially coming from Pretoria, we want people in the church the whole time, and we want them to be part of that. And we didn't understand the culture of the environment here. So one evening, it was an old year evening service. I decided I'm going to repent and say, okay, I will, scre- uh, I will make sure that uh, when we watch Rappi, I will make sure that the sharks is part of my DNA and I will not be a blue bull. I was never a blue bull. I was actually a lion. Um, so when I repented that, that next year, the church was full of people at the old year service. So, yeah, so you need to become a shock supporter just to make sure that, uh, okay, yeah, so that it's working. Just joking regarding that. Okay, no, off track. Peace. When we are talking about peace, it must be part of that joy. Joy is actually these two words, contentment and fulfillment. So when we are talking about contentment and fulfillment, Galatians 5 is giving us a framework that you are resting in Christ, that you understand who you are, and that you are living from that premises. But I've put up a statement here for you from Rick Warren explaining joy to us. He's making the following statement. He says, joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life. The quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right and the determined choice to praise God in every situation. (laughs) I hope this makes you a bit uncomfortable. Okay, When when I preached the other Sunday evening this in the Brooklyn campus, People were staring at me like you are staring at me right now. This can't be true, so I'm just going to read this again to you. So joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all the detail of my life. The quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right and the determined choice to praise God in every situation. Okay, that is one of the pictures that you need to take to put it against the freezer. So if you get upset and if you are not joyful, that you can remind yourself. Now, if you are going back to the scripture, it says, if you serve Christ, this is what it means to be in the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is not optional for us. The Holy Spirit is part of our inheritance. So when he talks about this, he says it's so important as a New Testament believer. The Holy Spirit is working from the beginning of time with you through your consciousness. 
And the moment you discover Jesus Christ, he says it's so important that the Holy Spirit will not just be far away, but the Holy Spirit will be part of every spiritual formation in your life. So here's the first key when we are talking about the Holy Spirit. The first one is being born again. So John 1 verse 12 to 14, and maybe you know Jesus Christ already, but you haven't read this for a while. It says every person that accepts Jesus as the truth and the grace. Sometimes we miss that. Because especially in our Christian culture in South Africa, we are so used to our framework of we just need to speak the truth. When we approach people, we need to approach them from a grace-sensitive paradigm. So we first need to see their value before we can speak the truth. So ask yourself, the last time you engage somebody in your family that don't know Jesus Christ, do you want to tell them the truth or do you want first to see the value? Because Christ died on the cross for us because he saw us as valuable. To bring hope in your environment, you need first to see the people around you as valuable. If you can't see that, then you need to go back to your right standing in Christ, your identity, because if you can't discover, grace means God's riches at Christ's expense. So it was because of his expense in your life that you can know him. And this scripture is telling us you need to understand that he is the father of truth and grace. I don't know if you guys have the same challenge here as we have, but there's a lot of questions about the LGBTQ. There's a lot of questions in our families regarding that. And the other night I had to speak to a small group Regarding that, and I said, first you need to understand the value of the person. And that Christ died for everybody. <laughs> Before we can speak the truth. <laughs> does this make sense? Okay, I can see this. there's some uneasiness here. Bianca, um, my wife, She's, um, she was a state prosecutor. So when we got married, um, we always had this underlying thing about understanding who we are and bringing the truth into the environment. And um, I think part of our understanding was to discover that we are valuable. If you have grown up in a very Afrikaans traditional environment, sometimes we feel as victims. And the victim mentality can only change if we see the truth. Okay, so, and then the father says, I will send to you a promise to empower you. Luke 20, uh, 40, uh, 24 verse 49 will give us that insight. And when he talks about this, I just want to remind you this morning, I believe that you know this, but in Ephesians 1, verse 13 to 14, he's making the following statement. He says, in Christ, in him. Now, let me just, I don't know if everybody understands this, because sometimes people engage me regarding, is the Old Testament still the same value as the New Testament? How do we approach this? And what I realize is the vocabulary of a New Testament believer is to understand who you are in Christ. So if you haven't written down the statements of the New Testament in Christ, you don't have the context of what he's explaining there. I grew up in a very Dutch Reformed environment, so I know the law off by heart. I can recall you need to love your God. You can't have any other thing before him. But do I know all the in Christ statements? Did you know that there is 27 of them in Ephesians? Hello? We are actually New Testament believers. We are not 
Old Covenant, meaning the law of Moses believers. That was written for Israel at that stage. We are New Testament believers. Do you know that there is actually 279 in Christ principles in the New Testament? Who has written that down yet? Because that's the vocabulary of being in a new covenant believer. And if you want to influence other people, you need to write that down or do CCP. Okay, sorry, it just slipped out. Okay, so, so what does it mean for me and you when we are talking about it? Ephesians 1 verse 13, making the following statement, he says, in him, in Christ, you also were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. Now, I don't know about you. I have been married now 23 years, and this ring symbolizes that I'm married. It symbolizes a seal that we will be married until we leave this earth. For new believers, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is never an option and the Holy Spirit is never far away. He says, when you heard the truth, the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you working already. You are already included in that. So who is the Holy Spirit? Because I need to explain this and just remind you of that. John 14, verse 16 to 17, making the following statement, he says, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another comforter, a counselor, a helper, an intercessor, an advocate, a strengthener and a standby. I love what he's saying here. If I can use Lorraine, come and stand here with me so that we can explain this. Very practical in terms of that. Okay, so what we are going to do is he needs a counselor. So can you be his counselor? Ah, Pierre. Come, Pierre. Can you be his counselor? Then he needs an intercessor. Can you be his intercessor, please, if you don't mind? Right stuff. Ah, great. Intercessor, can you be his advocate? Uh, Gerda, would you mind be his advocate? <laughs> then he says, can you be his strengthener? Now, I'm going to ask this guy. Oh, what's your name again? Sure. Shane, would you mind standing here? Can you be his strengthener? And then would you mind be his standby? So when we are explaining the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and I want you to see this because sometimes we feel we are walking into a space or an environment and we feel alone. Or we don't feel worthy. Can we move that today? Because when you are looking now at Lorraine, he says the Holy Spirit will live on the inside of you. And what in the Spirit happens is that is the picture it's actually eight dimensions of the Holy Spirit manifesting every day in his life. Huh? Okay, can you ever feel alone now? Okay, yeah, that, you're supposed to cheer about that. Okay, um, we need to work on that joy aspect here in Durban. But can you see the picture? So I want you to take a mental picture of this. Every time you go through a struggle, every time you feel there's no hope, just see this. This is where you are. Okay? Great stuff. Thank you, guys. You can give them a hand. That's good to hear that. Okay? Why is this so important? Why am I reminding you of this? Because we grew up with an old covenant mentality that God is in heaven, Jesus lives in my life, and the Holy Spirit is somewhere. Can I just explain this to you quickly because I feel it's so important. 
in our walk as New Testament believers, the Holy Spirit is working every day in your life, through your life, and even comes upon you. Yeah, I know that, Martinez. Now live then like that. Okay? People ask me, Martinez, you are going by the speed of lightning. I say, I, I told him, I said, one of my spiritual fathers always said, Don Price is now in London. He says the following, he says, Martinez, we don't love by faith, we live by faith. Okay? So don't love. We need to live. Okay, that's very important to understand this. So when we are talking about this, and I want to take you to another scripture regarding this in John. So what will the Holy Spirit do when he gives you the context? So when he says that, because in the previous scripture, he says at the end of that scripture, uh, just go back if you don't mind um, to the previous one. Yes. He says that there at the bottom, he says, but you know and recognize him for he lives with you and will be in you. Just tell the person next to you, he's in you. Okay, they didn't hear you yet. Just tell them again. Okay, he's in you. He's working on the inside of you. So when he's talking about that, going to the next scripture regarding that, he says, so what will the Holy Spirit do? John 16 verse 13 to 14, he says, the Spirit shows what is true and will come and guide you into the full truth. I don't know about your environment, but I often speak to um, teachers. I often speak to people and parents that are sitting here that says my child is being confronted in the school environment about truth and what we believe as truth. And I just want to remind you today that it's so important to understand that when we are building our lives in Christ according to his truth, I can influence my space, my family, my environment. And he says, the Holy Spirit will guide you into all the truth there is. So who wants to know about their future? Who wants to know about what is the next phase of your life? Hmm? Yes. You can't do that without the Holy Spirit. Because he says he is the one that is giving you the truth. So when we are talking about a resurrected power in your life, we can't fit into a Christian culture. We need to fit into a Christian nature. What does it mean to fit into a Christian nature? I need to die with Christ. I need to be resurrected with Christ and then now I need to live according to that reality. The biggest danger we face in South Africa is Christianese. 86% of our people say they are Christians, but our world, world is falling apart. So something of our understanding is not right. And if we want to become hope carriers of people that's really understanding that, we need to live according to that. So the second phase of my sermon, and I'm only now five minutes into my sermon, I don't know how late do I have, I don't know. Romans 5 verse 13 is making the following statement, he says, um, so he says the following, he says, Romans 5, 15 verse 13, he says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace again as you believe. So when he talks about that word belief is to discover Romans 1, 16 and 17. From faith to faith, living a righteous living according to that. So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting for me that if we don't believe that Christ can do it, it will not happen. So my question to you today is, do you believe that Christ can transform your city? If you believe that, then you need to act like that. <laughs> do you?
Do you believe that Christ can transform your university or your workplace? I often get people that come to me and say, Martinez, please pray for me. I want to go to New Zealand and get a job there and I want to change that world. If God is telling you to go, please go. But if he's not telling you, the door will not open. Then you need to transform your city. So it's so important when he says this, this is an incredible scripture. He says, it overflows so that you may overflow with hope, not just be a hopeful person, by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is impossible to bring hope if the Holy Spirit is not a reality in our lives. So what does it mean to be empowered by the Holy Spirit? Let me remind you, and uh, this is just to, for yourself to take a photo of so, so let's finish up here. A new, so why is the Holy Spirit so important? Titus 3 verse 47 makes the following statement. He says, for new life. So when he talks about new life, I love what the message commentary is saying about this. He says the following, he says, when he talks about this, he says, the Holy Spirit will come and wash you from the inside out super clean. I love that. <laughs> The thing that's so important regarding that is John 14 verse 12 is making the following statement. He says to live the same spiritual life as Christ. Now can I just remind you, when you go to Luke, especially in the last part of Luke, Luke 14 verse 16, I think if I remember, recall that correctly, he says, in my name you will drive out demons. Hello? In my name, you will heal the sick. In my name, you will speak in other languages. In my name, you will transform your specific environment. Do you feel, I know some of you feel that you need to drive out some demons out of your boss, sometimes out of your church, but it's so important to understand that you have the same power regarding that. The same power that was in Jesus is in you. <laughs> no, but I don't see that. Okay, just, we are going to pray for you regarding that. It's so important to understand in this to know God's heart is only possible by the Holy Spirit. Again, when you go and read the Amplified and the message commentaries regarding that, he's saying my spirit connects with God's spirit. It's so beautiful. Just go and read that. It's also confirming my sonship, my daughtership and inheritance, meaning that I am powerful and also a witness of the Holy Spirit, that I have the capacity to minister to people and that all the gifts of the Holy Spirit can manifest. Because we believe that the gifts in your life, if you are going to the Doctor Day website and you're reading there our belief statement, you will see one of the statements there says, we believe everything that happened in the book of Acts. We believe that. Everything. So, how can I then be sure, the last question, how can I then be sure of this empowerment in my life? There is an awareness that God is with me. There is an awareness of his joy and his peace. There is an awareness of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. There is an awareness of intimacy. I love what Paul is saying in um, 1 Corinthians 14, and you can go and read that just due to time. You can go and read that in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1 and 2. He says, I speak more in tongues than anybody else. And then he goes on in verse 4. He says, why are you speaking in tongues? He says, because that is the only gift that God has given you to build yourself up. And then they ask Paul, do we need to speak in tongues? Then Paul says a little bit later in verse 10, he says, if you want to speak in Afrikaans, speak in Afrikaans. If you want to speak in English, speak in English. If you want to speak in your um, heavenly language, speak in your heavenly language. 
do both, he actually says. And when he talks about this, he says it's so important to understand that everywhere we go, that reality becomes part of our life because there's an outward expression of an inward reality. And John 7 is explaining this, and he says the following. He says, streams of living water will flow from the inside out. So, let me just um, tell you my story. And um, Rian is going to, those guys that were part of our congregation in Pine Town will enjoy this. I remember when we started off in our journey as believers, we were part of a congregation as big as this. And, um, and one of the guys stood up one morning and he says, Martinez, he says, there's people that's sitting here that need God. And the next moment, I just experienced the Holy Spirit is just encouraging me to walk to the front. And he was laying his hands on me um, and we just fell under the power of the Holy Spirit and I was out for like 20 minutes and I had this vision of God in that moment that he is anointing me with um, a sword and sending me out. And I was one of the guys in the room that was sitting in the back. There where Rihanna is sitting, I was sitting there in the back always, keeping it to myself. But I don't know if your children are experiencing this, but there were some bullies in school, and Fanny was one of those guys in our school. And I remember that Monday morning, after that Sunday, I woke up that morning, and just to give you some history, I felt now I'm going to take my own life and a lot of things that happened before that. And that Sunday morning, there was a transition in my life. I experienced God for the first time in that sense. We always went to church. We were good sinners going to church because we were feeling guilty in terms of the things that's happening. But from that premises, I walked to, um, went to school and one of the guys that was sitting in the back there, uh, his name was Fawny. And Fawny was the bully. And I said, now, the, the teacher asked, is there somebody that wants to pray this morning for us? I said, I raised my hand in the back. I said, I want to do that. And I was moving to the front and just the courage of the Holy Spirit. And I was say, Fanny, you are sitting there in the back. I have a word for you. Come and stand here so that I can pray for you. So he, he came to the front and he says, no, 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 please don't do this. And I started praying for him. That morning we spent some time there. And from that day on, Fanny never bullied me again. But that confidence came from the previous day in church and that encounter with God. And it was actually the Holy Spirit that gave something of that. I also remember when um, we became part of that church, we were not baptized yet. And actually what happened is in the next few months, um, there were some challenges in the church as well. So, for instance, we only knew God for about three months, and the pastor of the church says now he's in love with his intercessor and is going to leave his wife. And they asked my father, can he guide them through this process? And he says, no, we are not going to do this. That is not the right thing to do. So there were some challenges in that church environment as well. But I remember at a youth meeting on that Friday, um, two or three months down the line, my, my father was battling with alcohol and um, he loved his whiskey. And many years ago, and for us that's more mature, we'll know this, uh, Brian Mitchell became the boxing champion of the world and my father decided he's going to just celebrate this. And there was a big fight in our house. And the next moment, my, my mother said she had enough. Our three children are going to leave my dad and stuff that's going to happen regarding that. She wrote a letter. And we were supposed to go to a party that day. And at that stage in our lives, my father lost his job. He had to do a job for half the price. And a lot of detail in that process. But what happened is just so incredible is he was driving because he was on standby to work. 
And he heard the Holy Spirit speak to him in an audible voice and tell, told him, Chip, you are not going to drink anymore today. And he went to work. And as he got at work, started working, he started praying. And he says, Lord, I pray that you will keep my family at home, not knowing what my mother just wrote in the letter. And by some or other reason, we were staying at home. And my father came back, and he called us all together, and for the first time in my life, I experienced something of that love, that he says, today, I'm going to stop drinking. And like normal Christians, we say, yes, sure, we will see. What happened is, there was still half a liter of whiskey in the cupboard. My father took that and threw it down to drain. And there was one that he bought at the, um, at the store. And he bought that and he took that, it was still sealed, took that back to the bottle store. And says, can you please take this back and credit my account because God has set me free and I'm not going to drink anymore. And I realized that was two weeks after a youth meeting like this that we prayed for him. And from that day, my father never drank again for the rest of his life. But in that evening, somebody came and stood by me and ask me, Martinez, are you empowered by the Holy Spirit? I say, what is that? She started speaking in tongues. And I said, uh, sorry, where are you getting this? No, it's, it's your love language. It's your, your speaking in tongues language that you can get from God. I says, oh, can I get that as well? She says, yes. And she started praying for me. And in that moment, she says, the words that's coming forth, the words that you see, just start speaking that out. And I saw three words. I will never forget that in my life. And as I started speaking that, something changed in my life. And since that day, I just are so aware of the Holy Spirit in my life. So let me end with this scripture, and then I'm going to pray for you. Ephesians 5, verse 18 to 19, is making the following statement. He says, don't drink too much wine. That cheapens your life. Drink the Spirit of God, huge drafts of Him. Sing hymns instead of drinking songs. Sing songs from your heart to Christ. And I don't know where you are today, but I just seen so in this moment that the Holy Spirit just wants to lay its hands on you today and empower you. Thanks for joining us online today. As a family, we would love to meet you in person. So plan a visit to our Doxadeo Durban campus by going to doxadeo.org forward slash Durban.